Hello. Uh, Hello. Nice to meet you. We're uh, from the EFF, and we're here to help. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. This is the Ask EFF panel. Uh, we're glad to see so many people here. I assume that many other people are at the Meet the Fed and will be along uh, after they've done uh, after they're done meeting the Fed. Uh, so, as many of you probably know, we're the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We're a nonprofit, uh, grassroots, member-supported organization that is dedicated to defending uh, your digital rights, your rights online. We like to focus on things uh, defending and protecting your free speech rights, privacy rights, the rights to fair use, to make innovation, uh, to bring transparency to government, and to bring sanity to electronic voting. Uh, we have a good panel tonight of uh, EFF staffers here. Uh, so to start things off, we're each going to introduce ourselves. Uh, I am uh, Kurt Opsall. I'm a senior staff attorney, and I focus on free speech and privacy issues. And okay. Hi, I'm Kevin Banks, and I'm a staff attorney. Uh, I focus on the government surveillance beat. Peter Eckersley, a staff technologist. I uh, work across the whole range of EFF issues, explaining the uh, technology to lawyers and vice versa. Hi, I'm Matt Zimmerman. I'm a staff attorney at EFF. I uh, work on a range of sundry things, but uh, primarily on, uh, what was it, uh, bringing sanity to, to e-voting, or at least attempting to. I'm Marsha Hoffman. I'm a staff attorney with EFF, and I focus on open government work. Hi, I'm Danny O'Brien. I am not a lawyer. Um, I am the international outreach coordinator for the EFF. Uh, bonjour. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer Granick. Um, I'm going to be new at the EFF starting in the beginning of September, and I'm going to do criminal law, um, computer security law, and uh, Fourth Amendment stuff. Yeah. And I, I have my cards now for those of you who might have been in my session earlier when I didn't have them. <laughs> All right, super. So we're going to uh, start off uh, with each of us saying a, uh, a few words, uh, a brief presentation uh, uh, about what, we're, uh, what we've been up to over the last year, uh, and uh, then we're going to go on to your questions. So we're going to start things off with Peter. So some of the projects that I've been working on over the last year, uh, one that I'm going to talk about a little bit this evening is uh, search privacy, uh, both from a practical point of view as a user and also as a policy question that EFF is campaigning on. Uh, another recent project I've been involved in uh, has been an electronic voting case in Oakland in California uh, where we were involved in a case where a court appears likely now to overturn uh, an election on the basis of poor record keeping with electronic voting machines. Uh, I've been involved in doing some research on iTunes Plus files and the, uh, the various tracking mechanisms that, intentional or otherwise, that are embedded in them when people download them from Apple. Uh, and, yeah, a whole range of issues. So I can, I can field broad questions about DRM and trusted computing and GPLv3 and anything else anyone wants to ask about. Oh. Yeah, do you want me to... <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, uh, that was a... Um... A general thing. So the, the particular talk I'm going to uh, go through here, is this a little better? Can you hear me? Uh, is on search privacy. And particularly uh, a project that we're working on to measure search privacy across different search engines so that you can decide uh, whether you want to use Google or Xquick or some other search engine and how much you're trading off uh, when you make that decision. Now, if you'll pause for a moment and think about the things you've typed into search engines over the years, over the last 10 years that you might have been using the internet or longer, and the fact that almost certainly every single one of those queries was logged and recorded uh, and probably associated with your identity, uh, and the kinds of things that people, maybe yourselves or other people, type in are potentially very sensitive. Uh, here are some examples of the kinds of things that you know, someone might have typed into a search engine at some point uh, that, that could be a cause for privacy concern. So health, sexuality, politics, uh, illegal habits, you know, probably more than 50% of the population of the United States engage in illegal downloading or use of illegal drugs or, and so forth. All of this information, if they've ever mentioned it to a search engine, is there and recorded. So we might like to keep that private. You can think about the things that can go wrong if this data that's collected by search engines is misused. Uh, 
you could, if you really want to go far out and think about worst cases, you can imagine blackmail. You can imagine someone who had access to a search engine's records being able to go to someone anonymously and say, well, we know that you were uh, having this affair or we know that you're engaged in this potentially illegal activity or anything else, pay us some money or else we'll, we'll uh, tell someone about it. You can imagine a government, uh, maybe not a, a government in the developed world, but maybe in the third world, a government deciding that some of its population have political views that they're not happy with and they want to use violence or intimidation uh, as a method of, of controlling those beliefs. And a search engine might have a fairly accurate record of, of who's thinking about particular dissident ideas. You can imagine search records being used for insider trading. If you had access to other people's search records, you could probably figure out from them, uh, even in aggregate, whether a particular company was thinking about launching a particular product at a certain time or not, uh, and you could trade on that. It would be untraceable, unlike insider trading that comes from within a company. Uh, you could use perhaps even these records for election campaigns in all sorts of interesting ways, particularly if you could figure out what the other campaign was searching for. Uh, you could uh, do research on, on what they're, they're thinking about. If there's an issue they're worried might come out, they'll have searched for it, so you can actually find dirt on them uh, by looking at whether they're searching for that dirt. Uh, you could do campaigns targeted at individual people based on their search histories, because their search histories will tell you which issues are important to them. You can build a profile of them and then send them a marketing message that's tailored to their beliefs and is quite different to the message that their neighbour gets, uh, etc. Potentially there are uses for stalkers and, and other kind of uh, personal threats. Perhaps they are less likely or less seriously an issue for search privacy because there are a lot of other avenues by which you can get uh, people's, other parts of people's traffic that's very sensitive, like just their straight out browsing activity may be visible uh, through the same channels. So a point I was making before without really elaborating on is that search records are tied to people's identities. And that's not necessarily obvious, but if you think about it, at some point, who here has typed their name into a search engine? <laughs> who here has never typed their name into a search engine? Three names. <coughs> uh, so that you three people who didn't type your names into a search engine ever, do you ever log into an account at a search engine? So, I mean, between those two identification mechanisms, you've basically got a real-world identity associated with every single search history. And the search histories are connected together not only by accounts at search engines, but also by a combination of IP addresses, cookies, uh, user agents and other HTTP headers. Uh, and all of this information can be used to link these different searches together. And even if some one of those those variables changes. If you change your IP address, for example, by walking over to a net cafe, but you didn't change your cookie, you know, maybe you had session cookies enabled and you didn't close your browser on your laptop, whatever, those different sets of searches can be stitched together, statistically speaking. And there was a famous example that hit the front page of the New York Times where a woman was identified without having any of these mechanisms linking her name to the, the records or to an account, uh, but just the fact that she lived in a particular community uh, and had particular hobbies uh, and particular things she was thinking about enabled a journalist to just track her down based on that apparently anonymous information. So who are the adversaries? We want to think about how we look at these threats to people's privacy uh, and what you can do to mitigate these threats. And the adversaries are actually pretty diverse. You have, for a start, someone at the search engine. The search engine just has the data sitting there, and they might not have an official policy of using their records for blackmail, for instance. But what is the risk that a systems administrator or a senior executive at that firm might be able to take a copy of that database or run a set of queries on that database and walk off with the, the results and use them? Um, what are the chances that someone, a hacker, might intrude uh, into the search engine's network and get access to those records. It's probably less likely than an internal attack, but it's possible. Uh, there are governments. Governments can probably be categorized in, into two groups here. There are governments that follow strict rules about how they use procedure to, to pursue uh, suspects. Uh, and so you need to think about that kind of government in one sense. Uh, perhaps generally we would have expected the United States government to be an example of that, but 
perhaps with some of the, the stuff we've seen with NSA spying, that may not in fact be the case. The US government may be willing to step outside the law in its pursuit of records on people. Uh, and then, of course, there are other governments, you know, Pakistan or Turkmenistan or China, where there won't be any legal regime really restraining the government's use of these uh, data points if they can get them. There are civil litigants. Uh, it's not something that people think about very much, but actually if you're involved in a, a civil court case to get someone a, a divorce case or a copyright infringement case or any kind of civil case, you could send a subpoena to Google and say, can you give me the search records of this person I'm involved in a lawsuit with if you uh, can show that that's relevant to your case. And then there's the uh, good old creepy person on your Wi-Fi or indeed anywhere on your internet link, you know, a proxy server at your ISP, etc., that can sit there and watch your traffic. And lastly, there's the possibility that your search engine will do obnoxious things like selling your data to a, a data brokerage. Uh, and so you've got a certain set of commercial adversaries there. So when you think about mitigating threats to search privacy, you really need to think differently about all of these uh, people who might get access to the data. How am I going through time, by the way? Be fast. All right, so there are countermeasures. We've published a paper about these. You can think about what you would do. I think everyone in this audience will be able to figure out the kinds of steps that they could take to defeat all of these tracking mechanisms. But you'll also realize when you look through this list that it's actually quite hard to follow. And so while you might be able to do it, the vast majority of the population is never going to successfully mitigate search privacy threats on their own. So what we want is changes to policy, either governmental policy, legislation that protects this data, or changes to policy at the search engines so that everyone doesn't need to be responsible for their own countermeasures to search engine data collection. Uh, and we know that the marketplace will respond to this. AOL lost 20% of their market share after they had that scandal on the front page of the New York Times. But we also know that while search engines are willing to engage in this kind of competition, they prefer to do it based on spin rather than actually delivering improvements to people's privacy. So Google, for example, came out with a post saying they had reduced their cookie lifetime to improve privacy, but in fact their cookies were now going to last for two years and be continuously renewed. Uh, and so they also have a program to, to anonymize their data after two years, but that's still an incredible warehouse of information on all of their users. Uh, I've got some nice quotes from Microsoft in, in their response to Google's move where they gave all sorts of hints that they would do nice things like uh, letting people search and surf at sites without being associated with a, a personal and unique identifier, which sounds like they're going to let you surf uh, and search with MSN search or live search without being recorded, but then they place this nice little qualifier afterwards used for behavioral ad targeting. So it, you will still be tracked so long as it's not for behavioral ad targeting. And that's only if you opt out. Uh, similarly, uh, they promise not to do cor unauthorized correlation of the data, figuring out which set of searches went with it, which other set to you know, c compile that record on you long term, except they've got the qualifier authorized. And they don't really say what authorization means. So if their policy says, well, we'll do it for marketing purposes, then they'll do it. So what we're going to do this is a project that we're, we're working on at the moment, is compiling scorecards on all of these search engines based on these factors that you can see up here. And we're going to go through and rank the, uh, the search engines according to, or rate the search engines according to their uh, compliance with these various things that we want, or users would want to protect their privacy. So you've got SSL, you have data retention, which is a complicated question, what kind of data you're retaining for what periods of time. Uh, can you opt out from being logged altogether? Ask.com recently made that move and we're hoping other search engines can be induced into matching it. Uh, do you have decent terms of service or are they kind of deceptive? A classic example of the deceptive terms of service are promising not to disclose information unless permitted by applicable law. And of course, US law basically always permits you to disclose the data. So you, you, the user reads it and thinks, oh, I've got these legal protections, when in fact they're actually giving themselves the right to give your data to anyone. Um, we want to know that the, uh, the search engines will have legal backbone to actually fight requests for disclosure rather than just handing over data. Hmm. I've lost my slides. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> I was hoping to get some feedback on the actual scoring mechanism we were going to try and use, uh, but perhaps I'll just say this about it. 
it's really hard to know for any particular user or for the average user which of those adversaries are the most serious. They're really quite different people who might get access to your records and you want to know one person might be worried about being stalked, someone else might be worried about a civil lawsuit, someone else might be worried about a government. So we're going to assume for our scorecard that each of these is an equal threat. Uh, they each ha account for an equal percentage of the, the score. And then we're going to look at the different, that list of things that we want from search engines and you see that for each of them they apply to some adversaries and not to others. So we're just going to calculate the score by saying well this countermeasure, if it's taken by a search engine, reduces the, uh, the threat from three out of the five adversaries and score it that way. Yep. Well, we'll, so I think what we'll do is we'll, I'll finish this quick talk about search privacy and then we'll bounce to questions afterwards. Yeah. All right. And so the, the feedback I was hoping to get on the particular search privacy project we have here is, one, the thing that we don't know about is internal security at search engines. And so that's the hardest unsolved problem in this puzzle. We'd love to hear feedback from people at, at DEF CON, provided that you're not incriminating yourselves by telling us uh, something or and you're not violating an NDA. So if anyone you know, has stories or insight into how secure, comparatively secure the, uh, the practices of the different engines are, that would be great because we can't get that data otherwise. And I guess uh, we'll be publishing some of these results shortly. So keep an eye on our blog. Thanks, Peter. All right. So I'm going next again. Oh, yes, Peter ahead. Uh, again, I'm Kevin Banks and I'm a staff attorney working mostly on government surveillance issues and um, I see a lot of familiar faces here. Thanks for coming. This is my fourth year at DEF CON and I absolutely love it, except <laughs> DEF CON usually overlaps with Congress's last week before recess, which means they're rushing crap out the door before they uh, run out the door. <laughs> and that's actually happening right now. Um, you, you, if you know anything about our lawsuit against AT&T, you may have heard of something called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is the primary statute that AT&T and the government violated with their warrantless wiretapping program. Now, the administration has been beating the Democrats with the Your Week on Terrorism stick for the past two weeks, primarily based on the new... Uh, national intelligence estimate which says that the Al-Qaeda threat has got grown worse and that there's a lot of chatter, much like in the summer of 2001, such that the Senate just voted 60 to 28 tonight to uh, uh, weaken FISA and expand the administration's ability to wiretap without warrants, um, probably even far beyond what the terrorist surveillance program authorized, such that uh, the, 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 the concern is that this, this bill threatens to uh, legitimize just what we've been suing AT&T over, which is the NSA living on the domestic network without a judge in the loop, able to scoop up everyone's communications and uh, filtering out uh, to get what they want based on an only just a trust us and without any warrants. Um, so. The most important thing I have to say tonight is call your representative tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, first thing you do, call your representative and say no to any FISA expansion before recess uh, because they are going to be pushing this to the floor of the House tomorrow. Again, the Senate just approved it 60 to 28. If you're a Democrat right now, you should be pretty ashamed. Um, uh, this is uh, particularly frustrating because our, our, our litigation on this issue has gone exceedingly well, albeit slowly. If you, were, if you were here last year, we were crowing about our victory in front of the district court. AT&T and the government had moved to dismiss our case uh, based on the state secrets privilege, uh, their privilege against disclosing information that could harm the national security. Uh, we won. The court uh, did uh, not grant their motion to dismiss. Uh, and just to give you an idea of how slowly the wheels of justice turn, the Ninth Circuit will finally be hearing argument on the government and AT&T's appeals uh, this month, August 15th in San Francisco. If you're in the Bay Area, try and hit it. It's going to be very interesting. Um, so 
Uh, so the AT&T case is moving along apace. There are some other interesting developments. Uh, you may have heard of a case called US v, I'm sorry, Warshock v. US out of the Sixth Circuit. Uh, this is a case where instead of directly litigating, we were amici or friends of the court. And the issue in this case was whether the Fourth Amendment protects the email you store with a third party, say your Gmail or your Yahoo Mail or your Hotmail. And to my mind, this is an issue that should have been litigated and decided a good decade ago, uh, but um, it hasn't been. And so we put in an amicus brief to the Sixth Circuit arguing that yes, you have a Fourth Amendment right, uh, uh, you have Fourth Amendment privacy interest in your stored email such that the government has to get a warrant um, before it obtains it. Um, and the Sixth Circuit, explicitly relying on the arguments that EFF made agreed and for the first time a, a, uh, uh, a federal appellate court has held that you indeed have that Fourth Amendment right. We're very pleased with that ruling. <laughs> of course the government is uh, seeking review of that decision. We will be opposing that. Um, another case that we wish we'd been involved in but we weren't aware of it uh, was one called US v. Forrester and this is sort of I like to call it the hangover from the Warshock party because it's a really bad Fourth Amendment internet decision. This was a Ninth Circuit decision where the court found that you have no Fourth Amendment interest in the IP addresses and email addresses you communicate with. Uh, and that the government can install what's called a pen register with your ISP to intercept that information in real time without probable cause and without a warrant. Um, we weren't aware of the case when we should have been, uh, but we're jumping in now to uh, much like the government in Warshock, we are going to seek, trying to seek review of that Forrester decision. So we are very busy directly litigating the AT&T case. We're trying to uh, uh, influence these other key Fourth Amendment issues as applied to the internet, which are finally, after way too long, really finally hitting the big courts. Um, and and so we're we're very excited that these issues are really coming to the fore. Um, but again, I'm much less excited because. The Senate just voted 60 to 28 to pass this crappy bill. So please call your rep tomorrow to say no to FISA expansion. Thank you very much. Hey there, my name is Marsha, and uh, for those of you who were here last year, uh, I'm feeling a little bit sentimental this evening because uh, the first thing I ever did when I joined EFF last year was speak uh, on this very panel at DEF CON, and um, so this marks precisely a year that I've been with EFF. So thank you all for being here with me. <laughs> and now Jennifer has the same experience pretty much, right? I mean, this is like your first EFF thing. Yeah. Yeah. Aw, the tradition continues. I love it. Um, so when I was here last year, um, for those of you who were here, uh, I told you about the fact that we were starting a new project. Uh, it didn't have a name at the time, but now we have a name for it. It's called uh, the FOIA Litigation for Accountable Government, or FLAG Project. Very patriotic. And uh, basically what we do is we submit uh, requests under this federal law called the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, uh, to government agencies to learn about uh, what they're doing in the realm of national security, uh, criminal law enforcement, yada, 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 uh, with technology to gather information about people. And um, it's been um, an interesting experience so far. We've filed about 50 requests over the past year. And uh, we filed lawsuits over about 10 of those requests. Um, you know, the big problem with the Freedom of Information Act is that it, it actually doesn't work very well. So you file these requests, and under the law, uh, agencies are supposed to give you documents responsive to your request in 20 working days, and that almost never happens. In my experience, I can probably count on one hand the amount of times that's happened. So um, instead of uh, getting the information that we want, usually we end up having to sue the government to get a judge involved to order the government to release information. So that's really my big job, is suing the government for stuff like that. And so we've filed lawsuits over about 10 of these requests, and we've had some, some interesting results coming in here, um, especially you know, right now. I mean, this is, this is the time when, when things are getting really interesting. Um, we had our first big, really nice result um, a few weeks ago. We had uh, filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the Department of Justice, 
specifically the FBI, to um, get information um, that was related to uh, a report that was issued in March by um, the Department of Justice Inspector General, which is like the internal watchdog of the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice internal watchdog had found that um, the FBI had broadly uh, misused its power to issue national security letters under the law. So we filed this FOIA request to get information underlying that report, the information that that report was based on. And um, as, as often happens, the request wasn't processed in the amount of time it was supposed to be, so we sued, and a federal judge ordered the FBI to release um, 2,500 documents to us every month. And uh, we got the first release of those documents um, in July, and um, we learned, among other things, that uh, the Attorney General was aware of NSL misconduct in the FBI before he testified to Congress in 2005 that he was unaware of any verified civil liberties abuse coming out of the Patriot Act. So that, that produced some interesting uh, news coverage and made the Attorney General's life even more hellish for a short time. And um, so uh, next week, actually, we're getting our second release of those documents, which we're really looking forward to. And we will, of course, put up on our website for you all to take a look at um, very, very soon after we get them. And we also have another um, interesting couple of things coming up that uh, you all might might be interested in. I hope you're interested in. We're going to be getting, we're going to be, well, we've already gotten some documents. We're going to be putting them up on our website shortly that are related to um, an FBI electronic surveillance system called DCS 3000. Uh, the FBI uses this technology to gather uh, information uh, about people in the course of both criminal law enforcement and intelligence gathering operations. So, um, you know, we've got things like security assessments and, and actually a user guide for this, um, for this technology, which is pretty interesting. And um, we also have gotten some documents um, out of one of our lawsuits that um, are related to this Army unit called um, the Army Web Risk Assessment Cell. And this Army unit uh, actually monitors websites and blogs to uh, see if there's information that's been posted that poses any sort of a threat to operation security or OPSEC. And um, one of the interesting things about these documents that we found is that actually um, what, the, uh, what the unit has found is that the vast majority of the time when operation security information has been posted um, you know, improperly on a website, it's been posted on an official military website. Thousands of times it's been posted on an official military website, and less than 20 times has information like that been posted by soldier bloggers. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so anyway, I am eager to hear uh, any thoughts you have about the FOIA work we're doing or any suggestions you have for FOIA requests, because that's sort of the grist for our mill, of course, are ideas for FOIA requests. And so um, I'm looking forward to hearing from you all either during Q&A or um, after this panel. Thank you. Hi again, my name is Matt Zimmerman. I am a staff attorney here at EFF also, and my main task is trying to help bring a little bit of sanity uh, to the, the world of electronic voting. Uh, I think we, we concluded uh, a while ago that that's actually utterly impossible. Uh, the, the, solution, the solution is going to be to get rid of these machines. Uh, there's just, they're, they're so broken uh, that it's, uh, it seems impossible uh, to, to ameliorate the problems, uh, to, to bring them up to, up to speed and create the kind of transparency and accuracy that, that everyone demands out of their, out of their elections. Uh, this should be a rather obvious problem, uh, but unfortunately, it, it hasn't been. And, and uh, you know, how we got here is is pretty straightforward. In 2000, after the the debacle uh, in the presidential election, Congress said we are going to do something about this problem, and they did precisely that. They cut a check for about four billion dollars and said, "Go out and buy some machines, and we hope everything works out okay." Uh, unfortunately, as we all know, it didn't actually work out terribly well. So EFF has, been, has spent the last three or four years uh, working primarily uh, towards fixing uh, problems wherever we can and helping put pressure on the various decision makers uh, to unwind, uh, un unwind their decisions, un unring that bell uh, to the extent that they can. Um, and it's a, it's a multifaceted uh, problem. We have brought suits in a number of jurisdictions or we, we've assisted suits in a number of jurisdictions uh, with some limited successes. 
uh, in North Carolina, for example, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, we were actually uh, we were finally able to convince a court uh, to come down with a ruling that may, that resulted in Diebold leaving the state. So it's a good good day's work uh, to make Diebold flee anywhere. Um, so. So uh, unfortunately, courts since then have not been terribly uh, have been terribly willing to to follow suit. Uh, we have uh, a couple of cases ongoing right now. You may remember the problem in Sarasota, Florida, uh, in the midterm elections, where all of the, the jurisdiction was using uh, ESNS touchscreen machines. And at the end of the day, when the the congressional race was decided by about 350 votes, uh, we had an undervote rate counted of about 15 percent, which amounted to about 18,000 votes. And that is, these machines recorded no vote for anyone on Congress uh, for about on about 18,000 votes. Uh, to give you a little bit of comparison, a little bit of uh, control group, uh, the ordinary undervote rate for top ticket races is about two to three percent. Uh, so we went to court and asked the obvious question of, uh, can, can we look at the machines? And uh, the judge there, God bless him, and I will only say good things since we're continuing in litigation, um, has said, N no, you, you, you haven't really demonstrated any need to actually look at the machines at all. Um, you need to actually demonstrate, you need to give me evidence as to why there's a problem. Apparently 18,000 no votes on the machine wasn't good enough. Uh, that judge has stayed firm with his decision. Uh, we've gone to the Court of Appeals there who uh, haven't so far been terribly enthusiastic, um, but we're hopeful that they will, uh, find that someone in Florida will finally come to their senses and actually, actually let us take a look at this. Uh, we have another uh, ongoing lawsuit in Ohio uh, challenging a lot of the procedures that have been in, been in place since 2004 or prior to 2004. Uh, but since there's been a change uh, at the top there, there's a new se a Secretary of State uh, other than Ken Blackwell who blocked every single move towards sanity in that state. Uh, we have a little bit of a shot and we're talking to the Secretary of State there who will hopefully give us an opportunity to uh, implement some new, some new procedures. Um, this week has actually been a very good week on the e-voting front. Uh, Deborah Bowen, the Secretary of State of California, uh, carried through with her uh, campaign promise to take a hard look at all of the machines used in the state. Uh, she commissioned a study that demanded, or th that forced all the vendors to turn over all of their co code, all of their documentation, all of their hardware to the state so they can do a top to bottom review. The results came in this last week, and, and I, I know you're waiting for this. Um, Diebold sucks, is the conclusion. Um, last week, the red team reports came out, uh, and unanim they found that every single system, every system, not just Diebold's, uh, was incredibly chock full of holes. Uh, of course, the response was, as you might expect, well, this is a controlled situation. This, you know, this would never actually happen in the real world. Translation, you know, we can leave as many holes in our product as possible, and it's now on the volunteer uh, poll workers and election officials to fix the problem on election day across the country. Uh, that hasn't been terribly convincing. It's got some, some play in the media, this, well, this isn't a real election uh, excuse. Uh, until yesterday, uh, when the source code review uh, reports finally came out. Um, you can go take a look at them. Uh, they're on the Secretary of State's website. Um, I was hoping to show you a, a couple excerpts here. We're having some technical difficulties up here, but let me just read uh, a, couple of the, a couple of the highlights here in the Diebold report. Our analysis shows that the technology controls on the Diebold software do not provide sufficient security to guarantee a trustworthy election. Anyone surprised by that? Uh, if we, the, uh, the team, the source code team here came up with a list of about 30 30 serious security vulnerabilities based only at looking at the at the code, uh, and they objected vehemently since they only had about a month to to look through all of this code. But they came up with a, a nice a nice list that's chock full of problems, such things as the TSX automatically installs bootloader and operating system updates from the memory card without verifying the authenticity of the updates. <laughs> I, I don't see what the problem is actually with 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 that. Um, in the TSX automatically installs application updates from the memory card without verifying the authenticity of the updates. 
again, I, I fail to see the, the problem. Um, one of my favorites is, uh, this is a two-parter, uh, a local user can get to the main menu system setup menu without a smart card or a key. Remember that one of the excuses here is, well, you're not taking into account all the physical security and all the crack procedures we have in place to prevent anyone from getting access to this. As the red team notes, the red team notified us that they discovered a way for a voter in the voting booth using only a paper clip to trick the machine into sensing a smart card reader hardware failure, that, which then sets the sets the voter sends the voter to the main uh, the main menu system setup screen. Now, combine that with our next fun. Uh, hack that's, that Peter found, uh, a buffer overflow in the handling of IP addresses might be exploitable by voters. So we now have a situation where you can take a paperclip to go back to the, the main menu of this system. You can punch in a IP address of over 256 characters and it shuts down the machine. So this is someone takes about 30 seconds to a minute to do this and it will, it will it very, it, it, at the very least uh, cause this system to crash. So. If you look through the reports, we have a wide range of vulnerabilities, security, s serious security vulnerabilities that, uh, that would allow individuals to either alter the results uh, of these machines or to crash the system uh, if their strategy was to just slow the system down, try to reduce voter turnout, things Can like I that. So, sorry, yeah, go, go ahead. So the uh, the report also conjectured that that IP address uh, overflow that that a, a user a voter could trigger was potentially going to lead to arbitrary code execution. Although it's 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 hard to imagine how you would be typing in shell code uh, <laughs> while while sitting in the voting booth. But uh, potentially also, uh, I mean, shell code isn't necessarily what a voter would want to do if they were, say, a Democratic voter in a strongly Republican precinct. Uh, they might just need to to write in enough code to zero all the votes. Uh, and if you can zero the votes in the memory and on the smart card, you and you walk in at the like towards the close of polls, uh, you can wipe out all the records of voting in that particular precinct that might have a, a particular political bias. Uh, so it's quite a serious vulnerability. So you have quite a toolkit of fun little hacks that you can uh, perform on these machines uh, and give election officials everywhere nightmares. Um, and that's precisely the problem. I mean, we have, we have uh, jurisdictions who purchased these machines uh, thinking that it was going to solve all the problems that they had in 2000. Um, obviously, it wasn't the case. Now we have all this money spent, and no one wants to admit that they screwed up. So everyone is, is blaming everybody else, coming up with excuses why we can't uh, change, this, change this system. There's currently federal legislation uh, in the House uh, that we have been supporting all along that would roll back some of the most serious problems um, of these systems, do things like allow access to source code, allow, allow qualified persons access to source code, and then they can make public reports to identify some of the system vulnerabilities that will hopefully bring, bring pressure then on the vendors and the election officials to change the problems, uh, things like mandatory uh, audits, things like that. Uh, at the end of the day, the solution, I think, is still going to be get rid of these machines. Uh, they're just awful. There's no way to fix them. As the, as the source, code, uh, uh, source code teams specifically said in these, uh, in these reports, they got as close as I've ever seen an engineer get to saying this is utterly, utterly broken and there's no way to fix it. And, and if you look at the end of the Diebold report, they, they pretty much say that. Um, wasn't limited to Diebold. Um, look at the conclusion to the Sequoia report. Virtually every important software security mechanism is vulnerably, vulnerable to circumvention. Virtually every important software security mechanism. So it's a little tough to figure out where exactly to begin with these guys. Um, so anyway, so in the meantime, um, we are bringing uh, attacks on the, on the litigation front uh, to try to call these jurisdictions and the vendors out when these systems screw up. Uh, in addition, uh, supporting legislation to try to get rid of the machines once and for all. Um, I think this battle is over. Uh, we, are, we, we will win it, uh, but it's going to still take some time because there's a lot of money at stake. There's a lot of people who have put their reputation uh, on the line to uh, saying that these systems are fine. So it's just a question of how long it's going to take to, to unwind this. Um, hopefully it's sooner rather than later. Uh, I'm hopeful that this top to bottom review result should really uh, dispel any notion um, that these systems are adequate uh, and hopefully speed that process along. Thanks. Hi. <clears throat>
Uh, I'm Danny O'Brien. I'm the International Outreach Coordinator um, at the EFF. I didn't, I didn't used to be. Um, uh, about six months ago, I was working on a lot of the domestic policies. Um, so if we have any questions in the Q&A section, I can talk. At, in particular, my job was basically to, every five minutes, desperately try and stop the, um, the broadcast flag from going through. And, um, and I should point out, because, you know, usually these things sort of, go on for a bit and we only really tell you when, when we're in dire emergency. You should point out that there are often happy endings and, and the broadcast flag is still nowhere to be seen. And, um, and that was... The I, and really, you know, genuinely, I think that was down to people constantly um, calling their representatives. I mean, it's very, it's very hard to do that with, with a lot of controversial issues, but specifically, you know, if, um, if they, they can raise um, the, the, the root password of, of national security. But it's, it's kind of hard to say that, you know, people will die if the broadcast flag gets implemented. So only, only people who stick their fingers in it at some point or something. Um, so so that, that was good news. Um, the, um, as I say, I'm now the international outreach um, person. Uh, we've now got, I think, effectively a new department um, at the EFF. If, actually, if, if you turn around, Matt, turn around, show, show the shirt. It's the shirt I want, not your... <laughs> Nothing else. So this is this is our new this is our new icon. This is our international icon. International is American for foreign, and um, <laughs> incidentally, incidentally, on the issue of this new T-shirt, when we say e-voting, we mean no e-voting. So just <laughs> if anyone's confused on the on the T-shirt, just be clear. <laughs> Fair use and e-voting for all. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so, uh, and the, we've we've always had a fairly a fairly um, uh, major international presence. Um, uh, various of you have probably have heard me bang on about this at various levels of drunkenness um, yesterday and my talk today. But but our primary concern from a sort of U.S. centric point of view has always been policy laundering, which is the process by which stupid ideas get raised by lobbyists in the United States by some fluke congressman. I don't know, awake that day, or, or, or Ted Stevens is in another room, and, um, uh, and it doesn't get through. And, um, and then the lobbyists immediately go to an organization like WIPO, um, which is a long way away from, from um, um, normal human people, and, um, and gets it through, and then comes back to um, Congress and says, we have to do this. We signed a treaty. We had to make an agreement. Um, an example of this that's going through at the moment, actually, which is interesting, is we've just done a free trade agreement with uh, uh, South Korea. Uh, South Korea notoriously technologically backward and needs to be taught how to, to do this sort of thing, right? So um, the, the copyright industry um, came in and said, look, they're, they're doing these, these strange and mysterious things with their, um, um, their 20 megabits per finger um, uh, operations. And, um, and one of the things that they specifically um, ask uh, the South Koreans to clamp down on in a free trade agreement is, um, is so-called web hard um, systems. Um, and web hard um, uh, is, is, is a great term, but what it actually means is, um, is online hard drives, basically storage systems. So uh, anything that, that, you know, like web dav or, um, or systems like this, um, any service that offers that um, has basically been portrayed in the free trade agreement as, you know, tantamount to um, you, you filming in, in, a, in a cinema. And this is storage, right? This is, this is like running an Apache server. This is, this is Amazon S3. And um, in a free trade agreement, which incidentally isn't binding on the United States, um, says that if, if South Korea agrees to this, and there have been riots in the streets over this free trade agreement, um, then they will have to shut down all their, um, all their storage services, or at least um, um, have them investigated. So these are the things that go on um, behind the backs of, um, of the the usual net democratic processes um, in um, in strange, mysterious um, places called um, other countries. So, um, so EFF has now has now sort of got a department. Uh, I I do the activism and. Um, and unlegally passed statements to the public. Um, we have um, a senior um, international attorney who does a lot of work, Gwen Hines, who does an um, incredible amount. If you uh, read the stuff about the broadcasting uh, treaty at WIPO, um, that, was, that was pretty much down to, to um, Gwen working with, um, with the industry to form a coalition to um, prevent um, 
uh, basically rules that would say that broadcasters would have a sort of pseudo copyright in um, uh, in anything that they retransmitted, including Creative Commons material, podcasts, or whatever. And um, and that was that was almost certainly a done deal uh, at WIPO, and would have gone the same way as, as sort of DMCA type language if it hadn't been for. For, for, for plucky um, NGOs turning up and um, and pointing out that nobody actually wanted it, um, <laughs> genuinely true. Like the Americans um, turned around. Like um, uh, the, there was basically a wipeout debate that everyone went, "Well, you know, but the Americans want it," and <laughs> and lots of people wrote into Congress saying, um, "Do you know that this is going through?" And Congress wrote back as one and said in their form letters. No, we have no idea what you're talking about. Um, went to the patent office, and the patent office went, I'm sure there was a lobbyist who was demanding this. I can't remember who. And uh, it ended up with the American lobbyists um, at, at WIPO, the, the government lobbyists, saying, who, who is for this? Uh, and going, we thought you, you were. I thought the, the, all the bad stuff's American, wasn't it you? And, um, and, and eventually it just stumbled and fell. So, so uh, another, another victory by... by um, by the stupidity of the other side. Um, we've opened a department at Brussels, um, and this has been incredibly useful because the next stage in policy laundering is this sort of policy ricochet between Europe and, um, and, and America. Um, you can see this at the moment in two particular areas, um, all being coordinated by, um, by uh, Mr. Gonzalez, um, one of which has sadly already passed in Europe, which is data retention. Um, Europe used to be absolutely fantastic for privacy law, and now there's just this huge hole that can be walked through where, uh, as... Um, as, as Peter mentioned, you know, just having these huge honeypots of data collection um, is, is an incredible risk to privacy. And now having a government requirement that all data should be kept for a certain period of time, um, whether you are uh, under investigation or not, is, is just making these honeypots um, uh, even, even more uh, tempting, both to government and uh, subpoena and um, uh, uh, malicious attacks. So uh, that was unfortunately passed. It actually passed the week that we opened our, um, our, our, our uh, Brussels department. Nothing we could do. It wasn't our fault. It wasn't some sort of hazing ceremony that the European Parliament threw on us. Um, but, um, so we were a bit too late for that. The, um, the next one is the criminalization of copyright infringement, um, which has been um, on the agenda for a very long time by um, the, the, the rights holders. And this is the, the idea, basically, as, as the rights holder has realized, it's such an expensive process. And thanks to um, court cases that, that, that many attorneys have very bravely fought and we've, we've attempted to support, um, it's getting more expensive to sue um, uh, um, uh, uh, individual uh, music uh, lovers for, um, for a, a very, under very small amounts of evidence for file sharing. Um, so uh, the uh, rights holder's plan for this is to uh, make the government pay, right? Just, just um, actually make it a criminal act so that the investigation will take place um, through uh, law enforcement. And we've seen how successful that is. Some of you may remember um, uh, mix, uh, mixtape, white label uh, DJs being arrested for the very thing that they are paid under the table for by musicians and record companies, which is to put out um, r interesting mixes of existing material um, and then being arrested by the police for doing this, for, for um, uh, copyright infringement. So it's a nightmare. The, you know, the, the, the idea that, that um, people could go to jail for essentially um, uh, failing to navigate the incredibly internecine and, and really increasingly vindictive copyright law. Um, there's a fight on in Europe that we're, we're um, uh, helping to, to lead with um, EDRI and, and various very good um, uh, European uh, groups like um, uh, FFII who fought the software patent um, fight. Um, Eric Josephson, um, who is a man in Brussels, is actually ex-FFII and um, has an apartment next to the European Parliament. So he's just sitting there with binoculars all day. And um, uh, he's very good at going in there and speaking to them just after the lobbyists have come down um and we, we've um, we've been do we've done an incredibly good job. We managed to get it um, watered down in the European Parliament. We've got the UK government um, casting very strong doubts about whether it's a good idea to criminalise like this. And um, and we've even pointed out um, drafting errors um, that um, the European Parliament votes on something, 
and then the drafters come along and say, ah, we, we, we thought this was unclear, so we've changed it. And uh, none of the MEPs noticed, and um, FFII and uh, EFF came in and actually raised this as, you know, perhaps a slightly undemocratic procedure to be following. Um, uh, of course, even before that law has been passed, that directive has been implemented, um, the, uh, um, uh, Mr. Gonzalez is already, he's like, his timing's wrong now because we've slowed down the process and he comes in going, well, they're doing this in Europe. Well, they will be doing this as soon as they've got through this drafting error. Um, and um, some of you may have realized, uh, seen that, that um, uh, uh, a proposed draft has been to do the same sort of copy crime in, in the U.S. And so uh, we're, we're now, we've always been fighting on two fronts, but now we've actually got um, forces on, on two fronts, and that's been really useful. Um, a couple more things that, that, that have been really interesting in the international area um, as, um, as Web 2.0 or cross-site scripting alert, um, as it's known here, um, is, um, is sort of proceeding. Uh, um, uh, a lot of these small companies, a lot of them in Silicon Valley where EFF is based, um, are, are internationalizing and um, are bringing in uh, new people, um, often in areas um, which um, don't have the same strong constitutional protections as we used to have um, so um, uh, and and th there are there are problems here and and I think it's really easy to describe what these problems are um, which is threat model um, a lot of these companies are very sincere in wanting to protect their users against um, attacks um, for instance in um, corrupt um, oligarchies in, in uh, um, Russia and Eastern Europe or uh, in China, protecting their users against the sort of investigative procedures that the Chinese um, government use against dissidents. Um, but they don't have um, a useful model for what those attacks look like. Um, and one of the things that, that, that we don't um, uh, often sort of uh, um, talk about as, uh, outside um, Silicon Valley is we do try and work with um, companies who come in and if they come in and want to discuss this kind of thing we'll try and point out um, uh, how their systems might be hardened not against the normal sort of hacker threat but against actual authoritarian governments and I'm very pleased to say that, that a lot of um, um, uh, companies even ones that you might not expect um, to be interested in that kind of thing have, have increasingly um, felt that um, protecting privacy and fair ex um, uh, um, enabling f free expression in those countries is actually something that does works very well for them and is a good publicity coup and is something that their own employees are very concerned about. Um, to that end, um, we're working with Amnesty International, um, CDT in Washington, and um, a bunch of other NGOs in an ongoing discussion with um, uh, Microsoft uh, Google, Yahoo, um, Vodafone, and groups like this to actually develop a code of conduct so that when they go into um, uh, um, uh, new countries or even actually here in the United States, they don't sort of stumble into by making technological errors in how they build out their infrastructure, um, creating uh, weak systems that, that are exploitable by, um, by governments. Um, so uh, it's and it's it's an interesting conversation, and I I, I hope it will, it will continue into the future, and you should see something hopefully by the next uh, DEFCON. And finally, on an individual um, basis, one of the things that we're increasingly hearing, and I'm sure you do in the news as well, is um, the individual um, oppression and um, arrest and investigation of um, uh, online journalists and bloggers um, and um, uh, um, uh, hacktivists in, the, in these countries. Uh, technology really now has wrapped right around the world and um, the sort of um, technology that, w the, that is developed here and um, elsewhere in the, in, in the world, in, in the developing world, is now being implemented um, everywhere. And um, what does that mean? It means that um, um, tools that, that, that you guys uh, devise um, suddenly have really important uh, ramifications for dissidents um, in, in the um, in, in other countries. And we, we actually, you know, on a daily basis now, get requests about how to remain anonymous, um, how to protect uh, people's identities, and um, and how to use the tools that, that, that are really being devised here. I mean, I, tools the obvious example, but really um, all kinds of um, defenses and protections. Um, particularly when, uh, you know, and this is just anecdotal, um, uh, um, repressive regimes are hiring um, hackers, are basically outsour outsourcing uh, oppression to um, uh, groups in other countries to uh, try and uh, um, uh, hack 
their own their own citizens um, without any legal protection. So I, I hope to maybe talk in the Q and A and afterwards about how we can help protect those individuals. So, um, yeah, am I working here? Can you guys hear me there in the back? Yeah? Okay, thanks. So I said I was going to do criminal cases and some other stuff, too. I just want to talk a little bit about the kinds of issues that I'll, that I'll look for as we take cases and decide what to work on. Because um, not all criminal cases are going to be great for me. It's not going to be like a new public defender office or something like that. Um, you know, I, I want to work on projects that have to do, so if I get a case, I want to know, does it have to do with free speech? Does it have to do with um, extending privacy rights to digital communications? Does it have something to do with um, promoting um, information flow and innovation and creativity in the computer security world? Um, is it something that will, um, where I can argue or try to help keep the definition of computer crime nice and concrete and comprehensible and, and relatively narrow? Um, <clears throat> so those kinds of issues come up a lot in the computer crime cases that I've you know, chosen to work on while I've been at Stanford, and I want to extend that. Um, also, um, does it involve new investigation, or maybe not even all that new, but does it involve modern investigation technologies that maybe um, we don't really understand that well, or courts don't understand, or defense attorneys could use some help, you know, figuring out how, how that stuff works and what should be uh, the reaction of courts and juries to, to that sort of evidence. And that's all the way from the um, interesting stuff we've heard about forensic tools that are pretty commonly used now, like NCASE, all the way through um, more modern kinds of tools that we're using um, on the battlefield and eventually I think we're going to see in the courts like fMRI and other kinds of brain scan information as well. So um, when you guys call me, and, and some of you will, and not because you're going to get into criminal trouble necessarily, but because you have questions about your research or you know something happens, those will be the kinds of things that I'll be looking for in your case. Now if it turns out that like we can't help you, that's okay. We'll you know do our best to try to refer you to somebody who is good, who, who might be able to help you as well. And just a general thing I'll say to people who, who you know often want to know the main thing that they call when they get in some kind of trouble or they think that the FBI is investigating them, the, the main thing I say is that <clears throat> you, know, you shouldn't fret too much about trying to get somebody who's super computer savvy because what you really should try to do is you try to get a great criminal defense attorney who understands the system where you are and understands the laws where you are because there's so much that goes into a criminal case that doesn't have anything to do with technology like do you get out on bail and how to schmooze the prosecutor. And then the, a good, these are seriously important things. And then a good, a good attorney doesn't know everything already. A good attorney knows what they don't know and how to figure it out. And um, that's always somebody who I can consult with or work with or talk to or refer to a real technological expert or, you know, something like that. So, you know, when you, uh, if something does happen to you, you should, you know, kind of think about it that way that, you know, maybe you're going to need to have kind of a team of experts to, to, to help you out. So um, I'm not going to necessarily only do criminal stuff. I think I mentioned this for those of you who are at my talk earlier today that um, in this uh, security power tools book that O'Reilly's coming out with later this month, I have a chapter in there about um, laws that affect computer security research and you know you can have questions about that too that arise in the civil context as well and those will be things to to contact me about also. So um, I will look forward to talking with you guys about those sorts of things um, in a kind of happy non-criminal context as well. <laughs> Thanks. Well, super. I, we have a lot more uh, things that EFF is working on. This is just a, a sampling. Uh, other things include protecting your right to speak anonymous, anonymously with uh, defending against John Doe uh, lawsuits, people using subpoenas to get your identity, copyright uh, uh, misuse in the sense of using the DMCA takedown procedures to take down things which are not infringing. Uh, and we're involved in a bunch of litigation to try and uh, expose that misuse and, and take people to task. Uh, defending fair use rights, first sale doctrines, which says that once you buy a, a, a something that it is yours to, to resell. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a patent busting project, which is designed to find some, uh, thank you. 
Uh, but uh, we don't have time to go into all of these things in detail, and uh, we're uh, uh, time to turn it over to your questions, and we'll do our best to provide you with informative, interesting answers. Yeah, is there an, I guess there is no audience mic. All right, I'll just repeat the questions, but okay, go ahead. Senate had already voted for it. Yes. Um, I'm not. Uh, you met. You wanted more information about the FISA bill. Uh, we don't have all the details yet. All we know is that uh, it does expand the administration's ability to uh, wiretap uh, so-called transit traffic, foreign to foreign communications that cross the United States. Um, <clears throat> without, without going to the FISA court on the authority of the uh, AG or the Director of National Intelligence. And the concern here is that the, the method by which they will do that is the method by which they've been doing it all along on our allegation, which is that they will have secret rooms of data mining equipment attached to uh, the domestic network such that all of our traffic goes in and we have to trust them that they're filtering our stuff out. Um, and. Uh, it appears, again, the details are sketchy. If you're wondering why I keep checking my phone, I don't <laughs> typically do this when we're speaking, but new details keep coming in. It apparently has a sunset of six months, but we all saw how sunset worked with Patriot. That meant that pretty much everything ended up getting renewed. Um, and so this might have seriously reset the bar in terms of FISA and kind of gutted a, a law that served us well uh, for nearly 30 years. And so, again, the House is voting on this tomorrow. The outlook is not good. Please, please, if you get the chance, do call your representative and at least let them know that you don't approve. Um, because even if they end up voting for it, they need to know what you think. To make clear, uh, you, you had asked about why, why should we call the, the representative after they've already voted. Only the Senate has voted, and so your your Congressperson, House of Representatives, uh, still has yet to vote on this. Uh, they are trying to do this over the course of the weekend, so waiting till Monday uh, may not may, may not be uh, soon enough. Uh, and uh, if you need some assistance getting that contact information, the EFF Action Center, action.eff.org, has tools that will help you uh, identify the contact information for your applicable Congress critter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, email uh, as a political uh, tool uh, is often overused with with form emails and even though people do things like put random scripts to make them not look like forms it just is not as effective as a phone call sir thank you thank you they will now he's an idiot because it's been all over the papers for the past week it's, it's, it's Might I ask which of your representatives or senators this was? Township was up on Township was up on the speakers. Oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So hooray for the Democratic process. Sir? So he'll know about it now because um, that's the reason why they can't go home. Right? So they'll be like, Oh geez, right, yeah, that kind of that same like I mean maybe it's out of your lane a little bit, but the your your ear and your eye are I think the yeah. So the the, the question is is I, I, if I'm understanding correctly, do we do we have uh, things underway to get more responsiveness and more disclosure out of uh, government, and indeed that is an aspect of our uh, flag project. So Marcia. Well, yes, yes, and no. Um, the Freedom of Information Act doesn't extend to Congress. So if you're asking about responsiveness from legislators, um, really the Freedom of Information Act doesn't help. Um, however, you know, I, I, 
I would say that our action center is a really excellent tool in terms of connecting people with their legislators and the more that people contact their legislators the more that legislators understand what their constituents want mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It sounds like so you're you're asking more of a question about things like uh, uh, seeing the bills as they are being drafted, seeing as um, that's that's not really something that that has been in our uh, our strike zone. We do pay attention to this uh, sort of materials in an advocacy uh, sense, uh, trying to stop bad bills and and promote good bills. Uh, but we weren't aren't working generically on this. Now, one thing that we have done is sort of a roundabout thing. Uh, we we've helped with a project to take uh, some of the C-SPAN uh, materials that are uh, videotaping this and make making that available, working with uh, 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 some third parties who wanted to make that available and helping them uh, in their in their discussions with uh, C-SPAN uh, to make that happen. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, uh, this, this is something that, that, that kind of obviously hits us sort of internally. Um, we're, we're, de we're members of, um, is it the Open Government Initiative, the, the group that... Um, there's a coalition that, that, that we, yeah, openthegovernment.org. And um, we, we've also been doing quite a lot of um, sort of talking with the Sunlight Foundation as well, which is a, which is a really good um, sort of grassroots um, uh, hack driven, essentially, uh, attempt to open this up. One of the things that they did was um, offer $1,000 to anyone who managed to persuade their representative to publish their diary. So, and what, what people would do is go to uh, prospective candidates, right? This was before the last election, and say, you know, will you commit to publishing it? Because one of the great problems with tracking what's happening with representatives is you don't know what, who they're meeting with, right? You don't know who, who, who they're talking to, and um, you don't know who's influencing them. And, and there's a, those sort of, there's a, there's a big sort of anti-corruption movement going on in, in, in Washington at the moment, and I think that the, the best trick at the moment is to try and hitch a ride on that. And for instance, um, um, uh, Senator Obama has, um, has, has put his name to um, a reform that would require um, uh, various documents to appear within a certain number of days online. And I think that would be incredibly useful. And so we support this and it would be useful for us. And we put people in contact with people, but it's not something that we're driving through ourselves. Uh, so the, the, I guess it was a comment more than a question, but uh, uh, mentioning that you should indeed uh, note the bill by bill number when you're calling. And uh, sorry, let me just say, please take a look at our action center, action.eff.org, which has all the necessary information to make this uh, an effective call. Actually, I'm not sure we have the bill number yet on, on this particular bill. Uh, on the, do we know that it's the bill that passed? Way to go, Derek. Okay, yes, then hit our action center. I'm so glad we have people back at the office dealing with this. <laughs> um, there, was a, there was a question that had been asked that I wanted to address, which was uh, uh, how do NSLs apply to search log data? And that's a very important question, and it's one we simply don't have an answer to, because it turns on what the DOJ reads the law to mean, and it turns on what the search engine's compliance people read the law to mean, and neither will say what they read the law to mean. Um, and so the basic answer is, we don't know. It's whatever the feds and the compliance people agree to in their closed door meetings. Um, I think there's an argument that, uh, well, let me put it this way. The Department of Justice has argued when it was good for them that search engines are not electronic communication service providers. However, NSLs only apply to electronic communication service providers. So if the DOJ doesn't talk out of both sides of its mouth, 
uh, then it shouldn't be able to use NSLs for search engine logs. But of course, it talks out both sides of its mouth all the time in terms of its legal argument, particularly when it's making legal arguments in secret. So I think the assumption has to be that, of course, they can get your search logs with an NSL. But in the end, we do not know. And neither the search engines nor the government will tell us. Um, I, I only have the post about it, um, so I don't have Do, the bill number. It doesn't say the bill number in the alert? It doesn't say the bill number. Uh, okay. If I have a net connection, I'll be also. Okay. Well, um, again, it is the bill that they're staying here this weekend for. So, the, the, I mean, the, so uh, if you say the McConnell FISA bill, uh, they, they will know what you're talking about. Um, I mean, or, or better yet, simply say, no FISA expansion before recess. Um, they, they will understand that. Being in the unique situation is that the only reason they're staying here is for one bill. <laughs> this is not a situation where, where the, the point about knowing the exact bill number is, is as keenly felt. So, Dr. Yes, leave a message. If no one picks up, leave a message. I know that question is regarding the EFF Europe and in particular the UP Pay Retention Directive. Um, the problem, I'm a European law student, the problem they're facing, and I've been very much involved in the auction legislative process of implementing the European Directive, is that once we have the directive, we have to implement it. Right. No matter what our civil rights say, right. because European law is above all Austrian law. Right. So I think we had a hard time convincing people that it was maybe not such a good idea. And I was giving talks all over again and writing the petitions to, to our people in, in the Parliament, and nobody cared. And the conclusion I draw from this is that we have to get all at the European level. Right. We do not have any European civil rights organization like here in the EFF or the ACLU. We don't have that yet. So Europe needs you. Well, you do now. Um. Uh, EFF Europe is, is actually sort of a, a membership organization. Um, we're, we're actually lobbyists. Unfortunately, there is also EDRI, which you may know about, EDRI, um, um, which... Well, it's a, it's a coalition of grassroots organizations. And, and so, I mean, the, the big problem that... that, that and uh, as, as, as someone who is European, um, I... I, I totally sympathize with myself um, that, that um, yeah there is this problem because what you have is grassroots organizations that generally concentrate on the national uh, scale um, and none of those organizations have um, uh, European representation right um, apart from very briefly um, uh, well FFII is a good example and um, also uh, bits of freedom um, I do did a lot of work sort of trying to build up a European department, uh, a Brussels department. Um, this is one of the roles that we're hoping to play, right, is that we have a paid for um, st staff employee in Brussels all the time. He has a really nice sofa and that any activist who wants to go and lobby um, uh, in Brussels, seriously, I mean, you know, his, his sofa is always open and you can come and he'll take you and introduce you to the MEPs. And the, yeah, the MEPs are totally shocked when anybody from their country actually turns up and cares because they're completely isolated and cotton-walled away from actual the, the, the people who voted for them. So what we're trying to do is to break that down and, and provide ourselves as a resource at the European level, um, which is what our grant is for, for uh, national digital rights groups. And we just had a really good, useful summit organized by um, the Open Society Institute, which was exactly this, where we brought everyone together and said, okay, what are the European problems? And now we have some stuff at Brussels all the time, um, we can do something about it. We re I really wish we had the same in Geneva, actually. Um, that, would be, um, that would be, I think, our next stage, would be to have a permanent person at Geneva, because it, it really does change things. What can you say about the DMCA and Wendy Seltzer and the NFL? Uh, well, Wendy, a uh, former EF... 
So the, the question, I don't know if I need to repeat it, but was about Wendy, uh, Seltzer, the DMCA, and the NFL. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the situation, Wendy Seltzer, a law professor at uh, Brooklyn Law School and a former EFF lawyer, uh, put up a clip of uh, a NFL game on her blog, on the YouTube, and, and via embedded uh, YouTube on her blog. And that clip uh, uh, was mostly the copyright notice. Uh, when they say, you know, this may not be retransmitted, any description or account of the game must be kept quiet. Uh, and uh, she wanted to make some commentary about that in her class. Uh, but nevertheless, the, uh, the NFL uh, took umbrage on that and sent her a DMCA takedown notice. Uh, and then she counter-notified, and then the, the, the clip was, was put back up, and there was a bit of a brouhaha with some uh, uh, talking points. And this is something that uh, we, we would have been uh, happy to uh, uh, proceed uh, if, if it had devolved into uh, litigation. Uh, but uh, it did not uh, go into litigation, so uh, our, our, our help was not needed, and, and Wendy is very capable herself. But these are the types of situations which we actually do get involved in. We've been making a, a bit of a push in DMCA misuse situations. Uh, there's two aspects of the DMCA, and, and uh, many of you may be actually more familiar with the anti-circumvention, uh, no circumvention tools, uh, that aspect of the DMCA, which is, which is fairly horrible stuff. Uh, but there's another part of the DMCA which uh, is not so bad, and that is the, uh, the DMCA's safe harbor, which provides protections for service providers who are hosting allegedly infringing materials. And it provides that that safe harbor is available so long as they pr do a notice and takedown process, where they receive a notice from a copyright holder, and then they take down the material, and then there's procedures for counter-notifying and so on. But one of the problems that has emerged is sometimes people will use this notice and takedown procedure when they don't actually have a good copyright case, or not even, in some cases, where they don't even own the copyright. Uh, but uh, through the, the, the sort of incentives built into the law, uh, the, the uh, service provider has extraordinarily strong incentive to continue to comply with this notice and takedown procedure, which basically means that the material is off the line for about 10 days, even if you counter notify and there was not even you know, any question of whether you had a good claim. Uh, so we've been involved in cases about misuse because there's a provision in the law that says that if you make a uh, uh, misrepresentation, uh, then uh, you can be liable for the damage damages that you have caused. And so uh, we have uh, uh, been involved in a couple of cases. Uh, one of the ongoing cases now is uh, involving the uh, uh, magician uh, or psychic Uri Geller and uh, uh, somebody, uh, our, our client, who is, works with the uh, Rational uh, Response Squad uh, and uh, uh, put up uh, a clip uh, that uh, uh, showed uh, Uri Geller and uh, uh, some of the uh, interesting things about how he does his psychic powers. Uh, and uh, some, you know, it, the, the clip is, is might, might be something that, that Uri didn't particularly like, and uh, his, or Uri's uh, organization uh, did a, uh, a, a takedown notice, uh, getting the, that clip off of, off of YouTube, uh, and uh, uh, we thought this was kind of interesting because the clip actually came from Nova. Uh, and so it really wasn't Uri's copyright, or, or, or so it didn't seem, but in fact he, he does assert a copyright and it's become clarified that eight seconds out of a 13-minute clip consisting of somebody else introducing, like the next person to appear is going to be Uri Geller, and he's amazing, um, that, that language was, he, uh, Uri asserts a copyright in, and, and therefore, that was why he took it, not because of the, the critical nature of, of it, but because of the strong feelings in copyright. All right. Uh. Uh, so I just called one of our crack folk at the home office, and uh, it is S1927. Uh, you should still go to action.eff.org to find out the number to call, but the bill that you, uh, we would like you to oppose and uh, make clear to your representative that you oppose is S1927. Thank you. Then the Senate, yes. Senate number, so it would be the, the House bill that would enact the same thing. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the terms and conditions just say you, know, if you don't own the copyright. 
right, can't do it. And uh, they don't mention also in their text about the, the pay down stuff. They don't seem to be mentioned fair use. Uh, well, fair use uh, is 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 your right to uh, make a. Uh, uh, the question was about fair use and the DMCA takedown procedure. So if someone uses a DMCA to take down uh, material and you have a fair use right to have posted that material, they may have misused the DMCA. And this, this was actually a, a case where we brought this all the way through to a published decision uh, was our good friends at Diebold uh, and there was some material uh, that uh, about their, how their voting machines work that, that had been uh, available on the internet uh, and they used the DMCA to try and get get that unavailable on the internet, uh, and the court found that that was so obviously fair use that to assert that it was a copyright violation uh, was misuse of the DMCA. Uh, now, the other aspect of your question was what about YouTube and their terms of service? Uh, YouTube has, uh, pursuant to the terms of service agreement, the right to take down material. Uh, and uh, it doesn't it doesn't have to be because it's copyrighted it could be because they feel like it and if you look through their terms of service you'll see they have a very wide latitude um, and so the the cause of action for for DMCA misuse is against the person who sent the notice to YouTube not against YouTube Alex? Uh, it seems that if I'm sorry, if people are what? I'm saying so if people are getting warrants for Google search information and then information is in court, there'd be some public record of it. Has there been, you know, have these records been used in criminal prosecutions in the past? Uh, we haven't seen that yet, but to keep in mind, national security investigations typically do not result in a criminal prosecution. They are for prevention. Uh, and so uh, we would not typically be learning of that. Um, similarly, often uh, uh, information may be developed that may lead to other evidence that does not end up being used at trial. Uh, but the only, uh, the closest example we've seen is people's caches uh, evidencing their searches being used. But I don't believe, Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we have yet to see uh, subpoenaed or NSL'd or uh, uh, warrant seized search logs in a criminal prosecution yet. Well, well I, one reason might be that the NSL process is not all that revealing. Um, you know, <laughs> you get all this information, but what, what do you do with it? I think the FBI's um, justification for this is to say that the NSL is just one tool in a whole arsenal of tools that they use when they're doing an investigation. And if the investigation does end up resulting in a court case, what they say is that they use other evidence. So, you know, what we most often see when you have these um, national security uh, type investigatory tools used is that they'll be a, you know, there, there may result in a criminal investigation of some sort later on, but it's not always readily apparent from the information that's in the case that it was national security type information that was used. So one of the um, ways that we found out about some of the kinds of surveillance that they were doing and some of the information sharing that was going on between the national security kind of people with the national security mission and people with a law enforcement mission was in that case that involved that truck driver or taxi cab driver or whatever was supposedly plotting to blow up the bridge in on the east coast and and in that case you know he had gone through there was surveillance they had wiretapping they went through he pled guilty i think they convicted him and it was only kind of subsequently after the fact that they had been doing this that the NSA had been doing this massive um, you know kind of dragnet surveillance only after after that, did we realize that, um, the, that some of that evidence was used in this dude's case? And so then his attorney filed an appeal and wanted to try to get more information and that kind of thing. So, you know, even the attorney who was involved in the criminal case there didn't know that this kind of specialized new national security um, investigation tool, which maybe isn't legally authorized at all, but they didn't even know, you know, that that was what it was. He, the lawyer, didn't know what he was looking at when he was when he was looking at it. Similarly. Um Kevin Polson recently discovered the use of a uh, magic lantern type technology, you know, where they can um, install uh, technology to surveil you remotely onto your, remotely install technology that surveils you onto your computer. And 
then um, you know we, we don't exactly know how Kevin found that out, but it was in revealed later. They had basically what had happened is they'd been using it, and they were looking for they they or they wanted to use it. And they put information about this is what we want to do in a search warrant um, application, and that search warrant application was in a court record, and then by looking at that court record. So one of the problems we have, and something which maybe you guys can kind of think about, which would be useful, um, is how can we as you know how can we like find out more about what's going on in these court cases than than we currently know. You know, how can we take a look at what's publicly filed on PACER, which is the federal court um, records of, of documents that are filed, or, or some other way to kind of give us more, give all of us, you know, in the civil liberties world and, and the public too, more of a sense of, of how these tools are being used and more of a sense of when these important issues are being raised kind of at an earlier stage. So some kind of, um, you know, our own sort of data mining of PACER, <laughs> I think, would be really great. But I, I think that's the reason. And I don't. I think to some extent it's because you know these cases are getting sh are, are just investigatory and they stay in the national security realm. And I think another reason is oftentimes we don't know. What? Yeah, why why don't we see it used more in just sort of your every everyday day to day crime? And I think some of that is you know there we have our way. You know the criminal justice system is slow, and the way we lawyers do things is like we have our way. We do things, and it's like this is the type of stuff we look for. And you know maybe these investigators these aren't you know internet people. They know all sorts of other stuff, but they don't necessarily know a lot about what records are out there. And they're not thinking, hey, I could get a search histories, you know, and and try to use that information as well. I mean there are laws that were passed like right when I got out of law school about changes in discovery and stuff like that, that, you know, in the criminal defense bar in California, at least in Northern California, we still don't follow those because, like, that's just not the way it's done, man. You know what I mean? It's like we have the way we we have the way we've always done it, and you know when we get into a fight, we point to the statute. But basically, like there's a way things go down, and that's how we do it. So, you know, some of it is just you know we're slow dinosaurs. Divorce lawyers will figure it out first. Right? Absolutely, divorce yeah. lawyers. Actually, uh, I, there was a great story about Fast Track, the ARFID-based um, transit, you know, toll charging thing, where it's become a serious honeypot for civil litigators, particularly divorce uh, divorce lawyers. And so uh, there's no reason why that won't become the case with search logs. Um, it just hasn't happened yet. Don't Google your new girlfriend's name. The only time we've seen that was actually in a civil case uh, of the governments, uh, the government, the, the ACLU, uh, and us, and and a group of plaintiffs are were, are challenging a law called COPA, the Children Child Online Protection Act, and the DOJ, the defendant in that civil case, subpoenaed Google as well as several other search providers uh, for a variety of types of logs, and uh, Google eventually had to give some logs uh, up, but not all of what the DOJ asked for, um, and not any identifiable logs. So the question was, what what are we uh, doing in the uh, uh, first sale uh, doctrine, uh, an area of copyright, and um, um, that's it. Sorry. What? Check the website on Monday. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was wondering. It, fair enough. I Check back on Monday. What our website? Yes, your website. Oh. <laughs> yeah, our website. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I leave I leave it to you then. <laughs> There's something cool going on, as you might imagine, and luckily Joe is right here. It, it's, a, it's a short answer because um, the specifics will all be out on Monday. But the EFF, along with my firm Kecker and Van Nest, is taking on a pro bono case, um, sort of testing both. Uh, uh, where, um, uh, how much you can do with things you buy, um, and how much 
uh, other, how much companies can do to try and stop you, um, particularly when you try and sell them on eBay. Um, so check the website on Monday. I understand there's likely to be a press release, and um, uh, yes, there should be really likely, cool. Likely to be a press release, and uh, we're, we're we're thinking it'll be fun. But so more generally, we're interested in the first sale doctrine. Uh, one one of the things that uh, is is a bit able to erode your rights. Uh, is is the notion that once you uh, buy something, it is not yours to to dispose of, uh, and sorry. The, the question is, I, sorry, it's very hard to hear you. Well, indeed. Uh, the, the rhetoric, uh, the question or the po point he's making uh, was that you hear a lot about theft of intellectual property rights, but not about the theft of property rights, the theft that would be occurring if you weren't able to make a, a first sale. And this is also part of the transition of uh, instead of selling you something, people purport to license it to you, uh, that uh, that it may seem like you go into a store and, and, and pick up a piece of software and you walk away with it and it's yours and you hand them some money and such, but uh, nevertheless, people might argue that in fact you didn't purchase anything and you just have this license right or maybe you have it when you click I agree uh, when uh, during in a setup screen and and so on but uh, uh, the move towards a world where you're getting a license to something instead of an ownership of something is is, is a more challenging one further questions um Mm -hmm. um, in 1996, the law was amended to specifically provide that if you want electronic copies of records, you can ask for that, and uh, the agency needs to give you basically what you ask for. So um, if you specify you would like electronic copies, um, you can get them. Uh, one of the problems that's come up in this is that agencies or the people who, who process the FOIA documents and prepare the copies for disclosure um, sometimes haven't, haven't fully understood that um, you know, they can make redactions and the re redactions can then be removed by the people who actually get the documents. And, and that's been um, you know, a, a source of, of concern. And um, you know, I, I think that agencies have been a little bit um, hesitant to really, you know, take this and run with it, even though it makes things more efficient for them. Um, so, in in my experience, typically what happens is when I get electronic documents, uh, and they're they're PDFs. Usually, they were they were uh, records that were printed out. The redactions were made in black magic marker. Then they were scanned back in, and then that, that's what I get. Um, which is, you know, interesting, but pretty much, I suppose, fail-proof in terms of being able to remove redactions. Um, I've also gotten things like spreadsheets, um, which have been, you know, very, very helpful. Um, I've gotten things on CD, um, you know, considering the fact that, um, you know, what I try to do is is make things available to the public on a, on a website. You know, I really am glad to get stuff like that, and you know, it's it's certainly, you know, short answer to your question. Yes, you can get them. <laughs> Pardon? It's a good question. I suppose they can do whatever they want. All right. Further questions? What do you think about the Ninth Circuit Court? Ninth Court feels a thing on contracts, online contracts. They said that companies can't modify an online contract. Oh, you know that one? Oh, the arbitration clause decision. Yeah. I. I can talk about this if you want because I wrote my Wired column about it last oh, week. Oh, sweet. Okay, so I, I wrote a column about it that came out this Wednesday for Wired News. I write a bi-weekly column and I wrote about this EULA issue and, and the contracts and this is a this is a kind of a great decision. What, this is, um, so there's two decisions I wrote about. One was Gatton and one was the other one and you're talking about the other one, the Ninth Circuit one. What's the name of it again? I forget. 
Yeah, some kind of normal name that I forgot what it is. But basically what this case says is, so, you know, for those of you who were in my talk earlier today, I talked a little bit about contracting and what the, what the deal is with contracting. And there's always been with these kind of click wrap, sh shrink wrap contracts, there's been kind of two issues there. One is, is it really a contract? Like, did it, you know, did the, did the, was there the meeting of the minds that makes it an enforceable agreement? And the second is, what happens, you know, if somebody did click agree, what does that really mean for you, right? So um, we went through this whole kind of series of laws about the first thing, and basically what courts ended up saying is you've got to have some ability to, um, you know, look at the terms or something like that. Um, they can't kind of hide the terms from you and then sort of spring them on you later because that's not really a contract. The essence of contract is, you know, this, this meeting of the minds, which is really this beautiful thing between two people, and it's, it's lovely. Um, it was my favorite class in law school. It's the most romantic of the law school classes. You're mutually bound. There's mutual consideration. There's an offer. There's acceptance. It's lovely. Um, it's different online. So, they, so now what happens is they show you the terms of the contract and you click agree because you're like, what the hell, I want to get through to my thing. And no, you know, nobody really actually reads it. Sometimes it's a million pages long and, and you know, did you really agree? So with this, what, you know, there were cases, specifically a case in um, 1996 um, that said, well, you know, when you click or if you just buy something and you see that there's like some terms of service stuffed in the box that you bought and you didn't bother to go return the thing and you kept on using it, you agree agreed. You manifested your assent either by clicking or by continued, by your actions of continuing to use the product. So you're bound by the terms and conditions that are there. Based on this very kind of like simplistic understanding of contract law is this, you know, meeting of the minds between two equals in an arm's length negotiation, which we know is total crap when it comes to the way that modern contract, modern mass contracting is done. And the great thing about this um, case, and one of the reasons why this case is, and is, is really Im important and interesting, is it recognizes the reality of modern mass contracting and says, listen, there's something inherently off about the way it happens. We're not going to say that these aren't contracts because mass contracting is great. It provides this great efficiency. This isn't what the case says, but it is great. It provides this great efficiency so that, you know, we can have agreements without having to, like, all meet and take time to hash out the, the, the language. But we have to recognize that the balance of power between us, the individual consumer, and them, the vendor, or the, you know, the producer of this computer or whatever the heck it is, is totally skewed. And these terms are offered on a take it or leave it basis. You either buy it or you don't. You you don't have any right to negotiate. And we're going to think of this as being inherently, inherently problematic. So um, they say that it, so it's procedurally unconscionable, right? There's some element of procedural unconscionability there. There's something off about it. It's not necessarily big, but it's big enough that it gets us past the question of, well, you agreed, so we're not going to second guess the contract, and lets the court go to the second level where it looks and says, are these terms then substantively unconscionable? Is there something wrong with what's inside the contract? Um, and courts won't scrutinize that unless you have a bit, at least, of procedural unconscionability. So it basically says, for every mass market, you know, take it or leave it, adhesion, click through, or box wrap contract, we're going to take a look and we're going to see whether these terms are, are um, overbearing or um, oppressive or unreasonable in some way. And in this case, it was the arbitration clause case. Um, the state courts hate contracts that get rid of, that have arbitration clauses because they get rid of um, provisions that legislatures put through to protect the citizens of that state and allow for consumer rights and class actions and that kind of thing. So there's a long history of case law saying, like, we, don't, we look askance at arbitration clauses anyway. Um, and, and that, this case is well solidly within that you know, kind of that line of cases. But the thing that's new and great about this case is it says, don't, you basically like, sorry Judge Easterbrook back in 1996, you were wrong. There's something about the way that online contracting or modern contracting is done that's a little bit fishy and we're going to make sure that customers are still protected. We're not going to just assume, hey, well, whatever you agreed to, you're, you're stuck with. So um, it, it's a great case and, and, and will help us get to the point where when you do have contracts or EULAs that prevent or prohibit prohibit, not prevent, reverse engineering or benchmarking or critiquing a product or any of those other things that we've come to count on as kind of like core and important um, things that support public access rights, um, it gets us that much closer to courts taking a serious look at those and striking those down as well.
person bound by the contract and have that be yeah, so he's talking about another case that was also in the same article that I wrote. Two cases came out. One was like a couple weeks ago, and one was a couple weeks ago, and one was some time before that. And there's Grattan, which I think is the California case, and then there's a federal Ninth Circuit case. And one case is the one I just described, and the other case is the case that you're talking about, and there you're totally right. It was like unilateral change to the contract terms. And basically what they said is, you can't just unilaterally change the contract terms on somebody without notifying them. At the very least, you've got to send them a notice and say, hey, things have changed. And then at that point, they can like have an opportunity to say, well, I'm sorry, I don't want to take your deal anymore. So you're totally right. That's another case. It's another great case because so many of these EULAs in terms of service and website things have, well, you know, we agree to respect your privacy until we decide not to agree to do it anymore. And basically what this case says is, well, you can't do that anymore. You've got to notify people and let them let them kind of pull out and withdraw. So you're, you're totally right. There's two cases I'm talking about, and I can't remember the names, so I'm, I'm mixed up about which one is which. But they're, they're both relatively recent and, um, and, and in my wired thing. Oh, that's the Ninth Circuit one? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Well, uh, the other one is cooler to me. <laughs> but they're both good. And they're both, they're bo and I wrote about both of them in my, in my Wired thing. So um, if you want to check that out, and then you can see what the name is of the one I actually talked about. The other one's, yeah, Douglas. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll give it a whirl. Uh, so the question is whether, uh, uh, well, pointing out that there are new e-discovery rules, electronic discovery, and whether uh, EFF is in a better position to take advantage of those uh, e-discovery rules. Is that a fair assessment of your question? Well, we actually, you know, so we try and do impact uh, litigation. Uh, and the ideal circumstance would be c cases in which we can win with a with a summary judgment or a motion to dismiss. So we're we're really we we are not looking for circumstances in which there would be substantial amounts of discovery because it's the legal issues we're trying to advance. Um, and often case, cases where you have a lot of discovery uh, and and you would have such voluminous discovery that you really want to take advantage of e-discovery, those are ones where usually it's not so much that the uh, uh, facts are unclear. I'm uh, sorry, in those cases the facts are unclear. In the cases we're looking for, often the facts are more clear, and the question is whether or not uh, what, what will, be, will happen uh, will be legal. Um, nevertheless, uh, we have some cases which are larger than others. If, if by uh, uh, good fortune uh, we are able to continue on with our uh, uh, AT&T uh, case for their surveillance, I would imagine that uh, e-discovery will be an interesting uh, aspect of that. Uh, however, we probably will need to go up to the Supreme Court before we would be able to get any discovery in that case. So uh, we'll have to worry about it at, at that time. <laughs> uh, so you were first. Uh, maybe not that EFF needs to do e-discovery federal rules as a tool, but um, is that going to be on your radar going forward to see that abuses don't start to manifest uh, in that area? I'll show your hand now. Ah, he's busy. Any other questions? Oh, Alex. Sorry? Yes. We we are. What what a great question. <laughs> um, 
We we are, and Thank this God T-shirt that you was modeled earlier is available uh, as as a premium for member uh, donations. If you join as a as a member at thirty five dollars and above, you get that lovely T-shirt. Uh, and we are in the vendor room, in the center of the vendor room, on the side towards the uh, towards the parking lot, I guess, towards the back. Uh, and uh, you know we rely upon uh, the goodwill of our uh, members and the support of our members to keep on doing what we're doing. So please do come by and get yourself a membership. Get yourself one of our new visit, T-shirts. Visit the dunk tank as well. And it's right, the dunk tank. Kevin and I were, were dunked earlier today. It was good fun. And every time you, you throw a ball, uh, that raises money for uh, for EFF. And uh, and we should have some good fun uh, with the dunking. So the question was about malware, spyware, um, uh, adware. I guess is the is another term for this this category of, of uh, things. Um, and we have taken some uh, some policy positions that are relevant uh, to that. Uh, we, we come from a uh, from a perspective of, of uh, people should have uh, control over their computers, uh, and so uh, that would mean that uh, you know, we. We like uh, tools that enable you to have that control and enable you to uh, get rid of uh, material that has uh, popped up and having things that are installed upon your computers without your knowledge and consent uh, is, is a bad thing. Um, but we haven't been involved in any, uh, in any litigation about that. Well, that about brings us to the end of our uh, time. Uh, because we just spent an hour with Q&A, we will not be doing the Q&A session. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you have further questions for us, we will be uh, at our booth uh, for the rest of the uh, convention here. And it's, it's so great to be here. We, we really enjoy it. And we look forward to seeing you all uh, around and about uh, the, uh, the con.